Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. And rounding out our day two coverage of HFES 2018, my name is Nick Rome. I'm here with Blake Arnsdorf, and we're also joined by Adam Brawley. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So, Adam, you are a doctoral student from Rice University, and we're going to be talking today about your Human Factors Prize winning research, and I'm like bursting at the scenes for excitement for this one. Augmented reality improves procedural work on an international space station science instrument. Yep, that's the one. I'm so excited about this, but before we get into the Human Factors Prize, y- you'll find out why I'm excited in just a minute. Before we get into the Human Factors Prize, I want to talk about uh, just sort of your area of interest and in research and um, kind of how you got to where you are now. Yeah, definitely. Um, so right now, I'm a fourth-year doctoral student at Rice University. Um, I started at Texas Tech University working with Pat DeLucia. I studied with her there for three years, or two and a half years. Um, and then right before the move to Rice, I did a seventh month, seven-month internship at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And that's where we got into the awesome AR stuff. Okay. So I can't wait anymore. Let's get into the <laughs> awesome AR stuff. JPL, here we go. We were unfortunate enough to not be able to go to this one. Yeah, and this yeah. is one of the ones that I was really, like, wanting to go to so badly. Um, so can you just give us kind of a high-level summary of what this research was? Yeah, definitely. So... The thing about spaceflight operations is that they're super complex. So the science instruments themselves are complex, and the instructions that come with them to install them, to assemble them, to maintain them, it's like a novel. It's super complex. It's often really redundant with lots of information, text, pictures, graphs, all sorts of nonsense. Um, And so it can be really difficult to kind of wade through all of that information and just get to the task at hand. Um, And so we saw an opportunity... um, to kind of ameliorate that using augmented reality. So uh, I was working in the ops lab at JPL, and in the ops lab we create immersive visualization software for scientists and engineers. So really quick, immersive visualization software, in layman's terms. Augmented reality. So (laughs) you put on on a device called the Microsoft HoloLens. It's kind of like a big visor over your head and you see holograms in the world. So imagine being able to view the Mars rover in one-to-one scale in any physical space. Flip it around, rotate it, take pieces off of it, stick your head in there and look at parts. It's pretty nuts. Right, so you're using that to... um, Sorry, continue. I I cut you off when you said... No worries. ...the visualization. So, sorry, continue. (laughs) Yeah, so we saw an opportunity there because you can present rich informational content through augmented reality and augmented reality itself, you still see the world behind you, but you also see the virtual content on top of the real world. So when we talk about these really complex uh, procedure documents and the instructions uh, for these science instruments, you can take that complex information and actually put it in the world. So you don't have to switch your attention from one space to the other, because with, with the, the instructions, they're not on the instrument. They're over here, you know, on your check, on your check board, what's it called, clipboard. Or like your log, yeah, yeah your binder, binder, whatever yeah, your, your binder or something like that, and so you really have to kind of divide your attention between all right, what do I need to do? How do I do it? And you keep going back and forth. But with the visor, with the Hololens and augmented reality, you can just put that information into the world and show people how to do a task. So you're you're are you augmenting sort of these um, procedural? You're augmenting procedural instructions over these instrumentation exactly. devices, right? So, exactly. so are you, I guess, what kind of procedural um, instructions are you giving? Are you saying, mm-hmm. like, rotate this piece X amount of degrees in right. this plane of direction? Or are you sort of overlaying, um, like, uh, toggling information? I'm like, mm-hmm. first off, yeah. what kind of instruments are you using? Yeah. So we, we used a physical mock-up of a science instrument called the Cold Atom Laboratory. And what does that do? So the Cold Atom Laboratory is basically a quantum physics machine that went up to the space station. And what they do is they take, like, rubidium rubidium atoms and freeze them at, like, super, super cold temperatures. And then they just let them go to watch what happens after a few seconds. So it's 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 a super cold quantum physics machine that they use on the International Space Station. So it allows them to study those, um, like, quantum interactions in the microgravity of the ISS. Okay. And then what kind of... um 
what kind of operations are they performing on this device? So for this experiment, it was pretty, it was pretty simple. Um, so we kind of we made an analogous task to like an installation and maintenance uh, procedure where participants were um, searching for cables on the instrument that were kind of just like hanging down and they had like labels on them. And so they would search for a uh, cable, they would search for the port to plug it in, and they would just plug it in. And then in some cases, they would search for a cable that was already plugged in and unplug it. So it's a really simple like mate demate task. So they're plugging in cables, unplugging them. Okay, and then so what kind of information are you providing? Mm -hmm. Do, does the augmented reality system identify the different cables and then tell the operator where to plug these in at? Right, or? so that's kind of, a, it's kind of a tricky ordeal with the cables themselves. But what we did do was we um, provided the participants with the location of the port. So we put a hologram around the port location, kind of like a little bounding box to kind of show them where it's at. And we actually put a virtual label in the world, like over that, to kind of supplement the physical label that's there. And we also used another augmented reality cue, uh, which we called an attention director, which is kind of like a little arrow that's in your heads up display. So if you're looking away from the like, target, there's a little arrow like, telling you to move your head, basically. And so it kind of guides you to the task location. So I guess, just for clarification, sure. is the augmented um, piece only on the destination for the, for the uh, cable, or is it actually located on the cable itself as well? It's just on the destination in this case. Okay. It's a little tricky to put it on the actual cables themselves right? They're because it's hard to tell where those cables are going to be at any given time. And so it sure. requires some really complex computing to do that. Yeah, I mean, it, we can kind of assume that that may be a future application definitely, once computing yeah, power. Yeah. Um, are you wanting to jump in? This is just blowing like my mind, to be completely <laughs> honest with you. But it's, it's awesome that you're talking about basically taking something that sounds like for dealing with quantum physics and actually being a science instrument for that, mm -hmm. I can only imagine how thick the manual for this thing is. Yeah, and so it's now you're crazy. And now you're providing like a task-based way to yeah. really deal with it and learn how to interact with it. Yeah. And I, I can only imagine that's got to be one of the best applications of AR there is, is trying to take something super complex and make it so you can actually use it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, so what we did, was we took that AR condition and we compared it to like a paper condition. But it's kind of unfair to compare AR to this really big, thick manual, right? Because it's like, duh. Right. So what we did was we took that giant novel and we extracted like the minimum amount of information that participants needed to perform the task. So like the name of the cable, where it plugs into, and we even gave them like a little, like a cheat sheet, kind of where on the, where on the device it's located, like the physical area. And so what we did is we kind of distilled all that information, and that's what we compared to the AR condition. And the results that we found are pretty cool. So when, so we had participants do both modalities, but we had them do we had half of them do AR first and then paper, and then the other half did paper and then AR. And so what we found is that when participants used the paper instructions first, it took them quite a while to complete the task. When they did AR after that, it was much faster. So if you just look at the differences between the two. Um, AR was much faster than paper. When you look at the other half of the participants who did AR first and then paper, you see that their completion times for AR were similar to the other half of the participants. So AR itself was kind of like in the same range of how long it takes to complete this task. But when they did a task after with paper, you saw that their paper scores were dramatically reduced. So there was this transfer of knowledge, like task knowledge or training from AR to paper, that was really cool. And can we, this may be me speculating a little bit, but can we attribute that to some sort of presence where um, they feel like that augmented overlay is present in their environment and they're, they're trying to, or, or um, I guess is it just due to the overlay itself or, um, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm like all over the place with this. My <laughs> mind is going to, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so uh, one point of, Clarification: Could we replicate this in a 2D virtual environment where there's no augmented overlay? Would you have sort of the same effect where if you were to co try to complete this task digitally by, like, let's mm -hmm. say, click and drag a, uh, a cable into this overlay? Do you think we'd have some sort of the same experiences? This is, is this novel to augmented rea reality, or can this be... Um, can this overlay method be utilized in other training... Uh, methodology. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So, let me answer your let me answer your first question. And I think 
what we really attribute it to is the integration of the two spaces. So you have that information space where your information was from before, so you learn how to actually do the task. And then you have your physical space where you're actually doing the task. And so that kind of divides your attention into two spaces. But when you overlay them, you're really just kind of bringing those two attentional spaces together. And it's that overlap that's really, I think, what is driving that effect there. Um, to answer your second question, there have been um, studies like this in like the 2D realm in the sense that they had participants do a task and they used paper instructions and then they presented you know paper instructions on an LCD screen or a tablet or something like that. And it seems like there is kind of a general effect of technology where people can kind of do the task a little bit faster if they, one, if they know how to navigate the software. So if it's just like a PDF, it's really simple. But if you give them like a really complex like software that they have to click through and search for things like that, it gets a little hairy. Um, but I think it's definitely a benefit of augmented reality itself in the 3D world because you can display this rich information using these holograms and throw that into the world and really bootstrap people into the tasks that they need to do. I'm like super nerding out about this and I feel like I've been monopoly monopolizing the question. So Blake, I'm going to let you... You're toss to me. I, yeah. I was... <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if the effect is really having to do with the fact that you're actually interacting with something physically. Because, mm -hmm. like, talking about the 2D sure. world, it's just going to, sure. I don't really know what the transfer is going to be. Yeah, or if you would so, see that same kind of interaction effect of, like, the paper versus augmented reality. Yeah, if you're talking about, like, a 2D task, like, using a computer, I don't think I would expect any sort of, like, differences to emerge there. Because it is what you're saying. It's a physical task. You need to physically manipulate objects in your environment. And by being able to put that information onto the physical world where you need to do the task, that's really where it's shining. It's because it's that physical task like you mentioned. Most definitely. Do you imagine that this would be easily transferable to a virtual environment as well where, let's say, there's a prototype uh, device that is going to be installed in the space station or, mm -hmm. or something to that degree? It hasn't been built yet, but you can start to train astronauts ahead of time through use of a virtual model in a virtual yeah, environment. Definitely. So that's a good question, too. Um, so, point of interest, there are two Microsoft HoloLenses on the International Space Station. So, if we wanted to beam some instructions up right now, we could do it. Um, but to your question, yes, I think it's a really valuable training tool because what we observed from the results of our paper was that after they used AR, they were much better using, you know, just the regular paper method after. So, there's that training that really just solidifies, like, the task in people's mind and gives them that mental model to really just kind of conceptualize what needs to happen. Um, the thing about astronauts, though, is that there's often a very significant lag time from when they're trained on the ground to when they might need to use that training in the future. And I've read that in some cases it can be up to like 18 months. So it's really unreasonable to expect them to remember that training. But this is great because that means we can take d the device like we use in this study and we can put it up there and we can use it for what's called just-in-time training to bootstrap those astronauts back into the training. And they're like, all right, yeah, now I remember what we were doing. Right. This is great. You know, now I know what needs to happen because it's kind of hard to expect them to remember everything they learned on the ground. Could you even take it one step further? And this might be a little too far. I'm not really sure like mm -hmm. what the capabilities of the HoloLens are. Sure. But just adding in that specific training into the HoloLens when they're interacting with the system and almost like toggling it so that they could review in real time whatever they've been trained on Yeah, prior. definitely. So the HoloLens does have a way to record what you're doing. Um, it might get a little hairy trying to kind of flush all that out, but I definitely think that's something that could happen. So you could play back and watch uh, what they did. I think that's what your question was? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that could totally be a tool for them to use. That's a really sweet sounding tool, I have to say. <laughs> okay. I have to call it, like, I could talk for hours about this, but I know we're running short on time. Um, one question I have for you. Sure. Uh, what can our listeners do if, A, they are interested in um, augmented reality, virtual mm -hmm. reality? What, what would you recommend for some of our listeners who may want to break into this field? Yeah, definitely. Um, for augmented reality, virtual reality in general, if you want to check out all the cool stuff that they're doing at NASA, JPL, you can check those guys out at the Ops Lab. Um, just in general, though, with augmented reality, even if it's just downloading apps on your phone to kind of check out to see how the technology works, um, the HoloLens is getting more affordable every day, and I think as the technology continues to evolve, it's going to become more and more affordable. So trying to get into that space would be super easy. 
Excellent. And where can our listeners go and find you or your research if they want to um, follow you or, you know, dig in more about this yeah, paper? Yeah, definitely. Um, come find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Adam Brawley. Uh, or you can search Rice University's website. Or if you want to check out all the cool stuff that Ops Lab is doing at JPL, you can look them up at jpl.nasa.gov. Great. And I'll be sure to put all those links in the uh, description. Adam, thank you so much yeah, for stopping for by. Me. That's awesome. I am like super nerding out right now. I hope you can tell. Uh, <laughs> wanted to fit it in one more time. Uh, Adam, we like to finish the show by saying it depends because in the human factor in economics, yeah. everything depends on the human. So let's wrap this thing up. That ends our coverage for day two of HFES. On the count of three, we'll say it depends. Ready? Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.